Well, just to give you a, a brief uh, introduction to myself, I'm Morris Gleason. I'm a, I'm a genetic genealogist, have been for the last 10 years. Genetic genealogist by night and uh, sometimes psychiatrist, pharmaceutical physician by day. Um, and I have been using DNA for the last eight years or so. And I'm a co-administrator on the Gleason DNA project. And last year I made an attempt to connect my Gleason surname with the ancient Irish annals and came across some interesting conundrums and challenges along the way and I'd like to tell you a little bit about them. So my talk is going to be available on YouTube as indeed most of these talks will be and um, I'm going to cover um, a variety of different topics related to the Gleason DNA project uh, which was started by Judith Klassen um, some time ago, about eight years ago or so. And we have a web page, and we have a blog, and we also have a Facebook group uh, where we uh, exchange genealogical information. And <clears throat> there's various benefits of joining the Gleason DNA project, but I'm just going to focus on two of them. Uh, you, can, you can see another version of this uh, talk on YouTube, and there's the link down there, and that goes through all of the different benefits. But today I'm just focusing on... Uh, how it, the, the, the surname project can place you on the human evolutionary tree and also help determine your deeper clan origins. So this is the uh, Gleason DNA project results page and as um, Robert Casey was pointing out, you just have a lovely coloured pattern here which signifies the genetic signature of lineage 1 and here are all the people in lineage 1 and you've got a, a completely different uh, coloured pattern here which is the genetic signature of lineage 2. We also have a lineage 3 in the project, and again, a very different colored pattern, just indicating a different type of genetic signature, all very distinct from each other, but people within each group are clearly related to each other because they have the same, broadly speaking, genetic signature. And we know that everybody in lineage 2 comes from North Tipperary, because their most distant known ancestors are all from that neck of the woods. Everyone in lineage 3 is from West Clare. Everyone in lineage 1 goes back to England, specifically Suffolk, specifically Cockfield, specifically Thomas Leeson, born in 1609. So it actually brings you back to a named ancestor. We also have a group up here, which is a US group, maybe Missouri, Ohio. There's two Gleasons up there, but it's possibly an NPE you can even see the name NPE there, non-paternal event, uh, not the parent expected, probably an adoption or illegitimacy somewhere along the way. And then we have a, a, a fifth group of all ungrouped people, and there's a good 25 people in that group. Some of them might be NPEs, as the results of NPEs, not the parent expected, adoptions, illegitimacies, um, or they could be just rare branches of Gleason's that have just um, don't have anybody in the database to match with at this point in time. So that's what the Gleason group looks like. Uh, DNA helps group people together, it helps identify a person's origin, and it also helps identify a person's ancestor. That's what you, you get <coughs> if you join one of these surname projects. Now we mentioned NPEs, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about the causes of NPEs they could also be, be terms uh, bits, breaks in the transmission. And it may, basically means that the transmission of either the surname or the DNA has been interrupted along that direct male line, father, father, father. Uh, excuse me a second, I'm going to cough. <coughs> excuse me. So here's an example of a break in transmission. Uh, for example, let's look at this lady up here. Supposing the children became estranged from the father, and rather than carrying the father's name, they decided to carry the mother's name. So what would happen is, you have the father's Y DNA now being associated, not with the blue name, but with the pink name. And that passes down through the uh, generations up to modern day, up to the 1900s. And the sort of things that, that uh, could uh, make that happen would be if the uh, children take the mother's name either because they're estranged from the father, or 
You will not marry my daughter unless you change your name to my daughter's name. You will not inherit my land unless you change your name to my name. And that was, so it could be for legal reasons as well. But it could also be to swearing allegiance to the Lord. Uh, so, for example, supposing the O'Briens were near where the Gleasons came from, uh, one of the Gleasons might say, please don't cut off my head, I'll change my name to O'Brien, will that do? And uh, the O'Brien will say, no, I'm not really happy with that, uh, off with his head, in which case you get no more Gleasons. But if they were happy with it, then, you know, you'd have an O'Brien by name, but a Gleason by DNA. And I think that happened an awful lot. Here's another example where uh, different DNA is introduced, so you get a DNA switch rather than a surname switch along that direct male line. And this could be, for example, a Lady Chatterley's lover situation, where the married woman is unfaithful and uh, Y DNA is introduced. Or it could be if there's been an adoption in the family, uh, the, the, the couple couldn't have children, so they adopted a child who obviously had a different father. In that case, Y DNA is going to come in, and that Y DNA will pass down the line. And that can be due to adoption or infidelity, for example. So this is a disconnect between the Y DNA and the surname. They're technically called a non-paternity event or non-parental <coughs> event, or as Emily coins the term, not the parent expected. I prefer to use terms like a surname or DNA switch because I think it, it's a little bit less technical than NPE. Now, there's very uh, many different causes, and I think one of the ones that we really have to think about when we talk about Irish genetic genealogy is the swearing of allegiance to a lord or a chief. And that could happen by servants, by soldiers, by vassals, tenants, and slaves. Uh, they, they took the name of the chief or the clan that they were subject to. And I think in all of our discussions, we do have to keep in mind that there seem to be an awful lot of chiefs in Ireland and not enough Indians. <laughs> we, can't, we can't all have come from chiefs and, uh, and the head of the, the clan or royal blood. You know, there's some of us that would have been the stock of Indians, you know, the servants, the vassals, the people that uh, did most of the work. So we have to bear that in mind as well. Adoption, fostering, and guardianship <clears throat> are obvious causes of changes or switches in surname or DNA. A young widow, and remember in those days life expectancy wasn't very high, so it might have been 30 or it might have been 40. If a young uh, woman gets married, she has a, a child with one man, then he dies, then she remarries the next year, um, the child of the first man might take the name of the second one. So that probably happened quite frequently as well, and it's something that James Irvine has pointed out as being a major cause of these surnames or DNA switches that we don't really think about. A legal condition of marriage or inheritance we've talked about, taking the wife's name upon marriage for social reasons. Oliver Cromwell was not Oliver Cromwell. He was Oliver Williams. But Cromwell, on his uh, wife's side, was a very, very famous um, ancestor, Thomas Cromwell, and so, because his wife was of higher social status, he took his wife's name. So we should have really been, had Oliver Williams coming in to do the conquest of Ireland, but it was Oliver Cromwell. Customary coupling with powerful people. Now, this, was a, this is a, a concept that I struggled to get my head around. Um, it was customary in ancient Ireland, apparently, for um, the wife to be um, coupled if, with an important visitor. And uh, they would go away and they would find a room or something and they, the wife might get pregnant. As a result of which on her deathbed there was a naming custom where the wife would say, I love you very much, darling, but our eldest is uh, an O'Brien. For example, just plucking a name out of the air at random. <laughs> <laughs> and a thanks to Dennis O'Brien for a wonderful presentation the other day on my ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> so, a very, very strange custom. I think it was, uh, came under Brehan Law, and people say that we should bring the Brehan Laws back. I'm not too sure about this one. Um, but under Brehan Law, infidelity and illegitimacy were very, very different concepts to what we consider today. So, um, and I think Brehan Law almost bent over backwards to avoid any kind of concept of illegitimacy in their society. So uh, we should bear that in mind as well, 
that there probably was a lot more DNA switching going on back in the good old days that would not have been frowned upon in the slightest. Well, another big cause of uh, surnames or DNA switches is anglicization of the surname. So, for example, the Irish word for green um, could, be, uh, could be a reason why Hoonies, Fahis, and even Gleasons um, might be associated with the surname Green. So, and that happens with a lot of surnames as well, that you get this anglicization. So, so two words that are completely um, linguistically unassociated with each other can, by translation, become uh, associated. And there's many other causes for these switches in surname or DNA that we have to bear in, line, in mind. And if we think that the surnames of Ireland came into existence about a thousand years ago, that gives us an awful lot of time for these type of switches to take place. <coughs> uh, so much so that there's roughly a 50% chance that the surname that you bear today doesn't actually go back to the person who originated that surname a thousand years ago. 50%. And the reason why we say that is that the NPE rate is about 1 to 2% per generation. So if you assume there are 25 years per generation, that's four generations in 100 years, 40 generations in 1,000, going back to the beginning of surnames, so that's a, an NPE rate of 40 to 80%. And if you choose 33 years per generation, it gives you a 30 to 60% chance. So all in all, maybe a 50% chance, a half half chance that you will not share the same DNA as the man who first held your surname, uh, but half of you will. Uh, so we can expect many different genetic groups to be associated with a given surname. So let's look at where um, DNA places the Gleasons on the human evolutionary tree. Well, when I talk about the human evolutionary tree, there are various versions of it available that I use in this type of research. Family tree DNA have the most comprehensive for new SNPs. Uh, y full is another company, and it gives uh, the advantage of Y full. It gives the, the dates of the branching points, which I find very useful. ISOG's tree uses the old terminology. It's least useful for this type of work, but it is the most definitive of the various haplotree versions you'll find on the internet. And then uh, for um, OR1B only people, Alex Williamson's big tree is indispensable and it's wonderfully uh, presented graphically. And then a variety of different haplogroup projects, and we have the L226 project administrators here, um, where they have a, a, a very specific tree on their website, and that can be the most detailed and the most up-to-date, drilling down to the most downstream SNPs. The, most, the SNPs that are the furthest downstream on the human evolutionary tree. If you think of genetic Adam back in Africa as the furthest upstream, then uh, the, the most downstream ones are the ones that the haplogroup projects are most interested in. Now, the optimum tree would be one that has all of the SNPs, the dates for the branching points, the surnames associated with each of these DNA markers, and the locations associated with each of these DNA markers. That doesn't exist yet, but like we were saying during Robert Casey's wonderful presentation, that is coming. Hopefully in the next year or two, we'll start to see some of this automated versions of these trees. So let's look at Gleason Lineage 2. And last year we took up some, took out, uh, undertook some extensive uh, big Y SNP testing, and the big Y measures 50,000 SNP markers on your Y chromosome. And it gives you much finer scale detail of your position on the tree of mankind, the human evolutionary tree. And when we started this, and these graphics are from Alex Williamson's big tree, this is where we were in January 2015. We had three Gleasons, no, two Gleasons in the project, a Prendergast, a Phelps, a Creamer, and a Miller, and a, a Carol over here. And... Uh, this gradually grew so that in April, the Gleasons were joined by a third member and split into two branches, Carol, Prendergast, Phelps, Creamer. Then in June, we had some more members of the Gleason uh, lineage two joining. We then had um, a Gleason joining in, which is a very exciting moment because uh, he was almost missed. He was so far distant from the rest of the people in the group. He only appeared in the 25 marker results. And I said, I'm not really sure we should include you in the project. This is by email. 
um, you'd really have to do the big why, and you've just spent $300 in a 111 test, and it's $575. I just kind of digest it and just leave it for a while. Half an hour later, I get an email from Family Tree DNA. Your new member has just ordered a big Y test. <laughs> In June of 2016, then, we're having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine members of Lineage 2 tw tested. And uh, we've got two Carols now that they're still the Prendergast, Fel Phelps, Creamer, and McCarthy, Miller, Tracy, Tracy. The tree is really beginning to fill out. You can see that there's these blocks of SNPs here. There's now four branches in Gleason Lineage 2, and uh, there's the SNP progression going back up to Z255, uh, which is up there, which is one of the more upstream SNPs. And then in August 2006, a lot of the previous ones, and if I just go back one, you see these are just positions. When you discover a SNP, it doesn't have a name. It just has a position on the chromosome, and then it, they get them named about three months later on average. So this is all cutting edge. This is all cutting edge science. And this is what happened uh, up to August of this year. And then I went on to WIFL and I um, collected the <coughs> dates of the branching points. So I was able to put branching, dates on each of the branching points. The brown ones are uh, calculated by Susan Hedin of the Z255 project. The blue ones are from Yful, and the red ones are the time to most recent common ancestor. So, for example, these two people here, their most recent common ancestor is estimated to be about 1500 AD, but the SNP that they share uh, started around about 1050 AD. So, again, there are huge ranges around these time and dating estimates, but it, you can see where we're heading. We're actually going to have a tree with dates for when the various branches occurred. And that's really exciting. What we can say from this is that based on these SNPs, this Gleason block here came into existence somewhere before 1125. So I brought the Gleasons back to at least 1125, possibly 1050, maybe even a little bit before then. And that's really getting back to the time when surnames first began in Ireland. And that's really a very exciting graph and tells you the beginnings of the genetic structure of the Gleason surname in Ireland, going back to its origins. And then we have a block up here that formed somewhere between 490 and 1050, and a block here that's 170 AD, and we can go back to Z255, which is roughly about 2000 BC. So a very exciting graph. Now, that's the, the key message, is that DNA can actually date your surname and characterize its evolution. It can also define the branching structure of your particular surname's family tree. And this is what it kind of looks like. There might be um, a pre-surname connection with the Carols. Um, the Phelps might be a recent non-paternity event going sometime in the last 300, 400 years. What about the McCarthy's and the Creamers? Well, maybe the Creamer was a recent non-paternity event. The McCarthy's, they might have been an ancient non-paternity event and are somehow related with the Tracy's. But, but which came first? Who's related to who? And, of course, MPEs happened before surnames as well. There's the line of about 1000 AD when surnames happened. Uh, so this is what you have to try and figure out, is which came first? The O'Brien egg or the Gleason chicken? <laughs> So that was placing us on the human evolutionary tree, and it's, it's told us a lot already. But let's look and see if we can determine the deeper clan origins of the family. Um, what have we found via DNA, and what would we expect to find based on the genealogy? So one approach is you're taking the DNA and you're saying, what does this tell us about the genealogy? And the other approach is you're taking the genealogy and you're asking, well, what would we expect to find in the DNA? if the genealogy is correct, the ancient genealogies. So let's look at the DNA first. We've seen this already. Uh, quite clearly, let's put it in a, in a graph. And this is just looking at the project-specific DNA. We'll come to the haplotree DNA later. But the project-specific DNA tells us there's these four groups, the English, the North Tipperary, the West Clare, and this US group. And the DNA marker for the English is, is well-defined. The north tip goes Z255 and all the way down to Z16437 and then branch out into Gleason-specific SNPs. 
West Clare Gleasons are Dalcassians. L226 is the defining marker, and the defining marker in the US group is J, terminal SNP M172. The time to most recent common ancestor, yeah, we've defined that, 1609 for the English, somewhere around 500 for the North Tip ones, 1750 for West Clare, and the US ones are about 1800. Most recent common ancestor, probably a Thomas Gleason for, for the English Gleasons in lineage one. Uh, lineage two, we haven't identified a person for the most recent common ancestor, but we have possibly for the lineage three in West Clare. It's probably Cornelius Gleason, born about 1750. And we don't know who the most recent common ancestor is for the US group. The location, Suffolk, North Tip, West Clare, and then Ohio or Missouri. Is it an NPE? The English one? I don't know. We have no idea. The, the North Tip is probably a pre-surname connection with everybody else. There might be a recent NPE for the West Clares. You know, an O'Brien might have been around in the 1500s, 1600s, uh, and the Gleason's, uh, and took the Gleason name for whatever reason. Um, and the U.S. ones, probably a recent NPE because they suspect that from their own personal family genealogy as well. Uh, possible clan association, just for the West Clarens. L226 suggests that they would be Dalgash. So that's what the DNA tells us about the genealogy. What would we expect to find in the DNA results based on the genealogy, the historical evidence in the ancient text? So it's taking it the, looking at it from the other perspective. Well, there's a variety of different sources for the ancient genealogies. Um, we can look at John Grenham's uh, surname distribution maps. They're very, very useful. Uh, surname dictionaries like Wolf, McLeisett, and O'Hart can be useful. And all the ones with a link here are available online. There's general sources like uh, Google, that you can find on Google, such as the Plans of Ireland and Wikipedia, the font of all knowledge. <laughs> Be very, very careful that there are lots of errors, lots of errors in Wikipedia. Um, there are various learned texts, and for us Gleasons, there's Dermot F. Gleason and the Reverend John Gleason, who've, who've uh, published a lot of local histories. There's David Austin Larkin, who wrote a book on the Irish Septs back in 2007. Um, he's Australian, I think. Have you come across him? No? No? Um, there's various academic journals as well. A lot of them are available online. Um, the Journal of the Cork Historical and Archaeological Society, for example, um, to Tipperary Historical Journal, North Munster Antiquarian Journal as well. Some useful um, uh, articles in those journals. And then the Ancient Annals. The Annals of the Four Masters is available online. The Linea Antiqua by Roger O'Farrell is online as well. Celts, uh, which is a project down in Cork, has um, a lot of information online. Bartiaski's uh, thesis on early Irish kingship and succession, that is available online, uh, you just Google that, and that he has included 76 pages of tabular genealogies for all of the major Irish lineages. But it is incomplete, and he did not use the last reference, Leower Mornan and Nailoch, the great book of Irish genealogies, written in 1650, and edited and published by Nolig Omwirila from University College Galway, in 2004. That's where I found my North Tipperary Gleasons. Uh, Jared brought it in the other day. I did my uh, lumbar the spine trying to lift it up off the table. It's a massive volume. There's six volumes, and I think it's about 1,800 pages or more than that. So it's absolutely huge. But Jared very kindly has uh, loaned his copy to the Genealogical Society of Ireland and they have it in their um, archive in Dunleary. Uh, so if you do want to go down and consult it, go down, look at the index first for your uh, surname, and then uh, you will actually go to the relevant page, which is in Irish, with an English translation on the other page. Will it be digitized? Will it be digitized? Yeah, we're, we're, that's the project we're working on now. Right. However, uh, all of the original text is in the UCD online, so you can access the original. So you can access the original in the UCD in Gaelic. In Gaelic. <laughs> and, and we know you're fluent in Gaelic, Dennis. Uh, well, my 12-year-old grandson is. Yes. Oh, right. Okay. Very good. So uh, once more, the grandchildren are showing us what to do. Exactly. Fabulous. So I used uh, these sources to see if I could find Gleason um, 
uh, names in the ancient annals, starting off with John Grenham's wonderful maps. And here you can see in the 1850s Griffith's valuation, there's a blob of leases generally concentrated over North Tipperary, which most people would assume was the traditional uh, homeland of the Gleasons. And when we look at Pender's census from the 1650s, and um, the titulados, the titled people, uh, you see some titled Gleasons again in that area of North Tipperary. So we're looking for an origin in North Tip, maybe one main DNA signature with a couple of smaller percentages of other DNA signatures over time. The surname dictionaries tell us that uh, Gleason means a descendant of Blossom, which is a diminutive of gloss or grey. In other places it will be green. Um, <coughs> it is uh, found in Cork, Limerick, Tipperary and Kilkenny. And um, in Kerry it is anglicised to the same. Um, the main step is located in Lower Ormond, exactly in that area of North Tipperary. <coughs> when we look at MacLeisite in Irish families, he says they belong to the Ara. Okay, so who were the Ara? And immediately you have this problem of translation and pronunciation and people spelling the same thing in different ways. It's very confusing and you can get easily misled. Um, the country was County Tipperary between Nina and Loch Derg. Again, that same area that you see on the maps. Um, the Barony of Ara. So the Ara, Barony of Ara was named after the Ara. Um, but they were originally from Muscree County Cork. So now we're being translocated to County Cork. We're in a different area of the country completely. Um, they lived in the Mac i Vrian Ara's country. So now we have a named individual. They um, were of the same stock as the O'Donoghans. Now remember the O'Donoghans because they've caused me a lot of trouble. <laughs> now there's also, uh, they were not Dalcassians according to MacLysis. And what else do we have there? Yes, so that was, uh, that was what MacLysis said, but there's no sources mentioned. Now you can find MacLysis sources apparently if you go to the National Library, but that just gives you an indication of how uh, disparate the actual sources are. So um, another surname dictionary shows that, uh, from Reverend Patrick Wolf, that there were MacFlashines in Ulster, and it means green, son of Flashine, uh, diminutive of Bloss, meaning greater green, a West Ulster surname. And certainly in the 1911 census, we have MacLashan, MacLasher, and MacLashan uh, in Down, Leitrim, and Dublin. So this raises the question, did some MacLashans become Glashin and then Gleason? Are they a separate genetic group? Uh, do I need, to, I need to test these people to find out if there's any kind of similarity with um, other Gleasons? Maybe some of the ungrouped Gleasons belong to this group. Um, the surname dictionaries for the, uh, also talk about Gleasons in East Cork. Uh, the name of the family who were anciently seated in the barony of Immokilly, but long dispersed through Munster, now very rare. So, uh, and O'Hart kind of confirms this. He says, Oglashin or Gleeson uh, were chiefs of Immokilly, he Machilly, now the barony of Immokilly in County Cork. Uh, so is this a separate genetic group to the ones we see in North Tipperary and Ulster? Are there, in fact, three distinct groups of the Gleasons spread across the island of Ireland? How likely is a multi-origin surname? How likely is it that the name Gleason sprung up spontaneously in three or four or five different places throughout Ireland at around about the same time? The answer is very likely. Because gloss means grey or green. <coughs> Glossine is the diminutive, little green. How likely is it that in ancient Ireland there were lots of little green men running around? <laughs> <laughs> were the Gleason's leprechauns? <laughs> or Martians? <laughs> also, if you look at the index of Lower Morn and Aelock, Glosson was also used as a forename. So it was all, you could be Glosson O'Brien, for example. So the surname evolution. Is this a theory? We had the, the, Mus the Donegans uh, associated with the, the Gleasons in Muscree County, Cork. Uh, they moved up to Ara, so we are told. But did they originally come from Immokilly in East Cork and then move over to Muscree and then up to Ara? So are we looking at several mass migrations of an entire group of people? Or are we looking at two to three different possible origins for the surname? Are we looking for two to three distinct genetic signatures. 
Well, we can add a little bit to our chart. We now know that the North Tipperary people, according to McLeishes and Dermot Eftleeson, came from Muskerry, and we've added two more groups in, an Ulster group and an East Cork group. But we've no idea if they have a DNA marker, a most recent common ancestor. Uh, we have some idea of where their um, lo ancestral location might be, but we don't know anything else about them, because no DNA, no information. So... Here's a couple of uh, slides on uh, what the annals say. So now this is going back into Lyawar Morn and the Nailoc. And remember, this is not online in an English format. So you have to go to Dunleary Library, take out Gerard's book, open the book. It's also the National Library. Go to the index and then go to the appropriate book and find this little um, blurb. And uh, the Ulster Gleasons are descended from the Fir Ulla, the men of Ulster, the Dal Fiatuk. And again, uh, apologies to any Irish scholars in the audience for my probably appalling uh, pronunciation of our Gaelic language, which I uh, didn't learn enough in school. Um, and the men of Ulster are descended from Fiatha Fionn, um, and there's the whole lineage there ending up with Damon, and then his son was, was Glossoin, and from which the kennel Glossoin uh, came from, the kennel being a kind of a sept or a mini clan. Um, if this is true, if this ancient genealogy is not propaganda, then uh, there should be similar DNA signatures with related surnames. So, for example, Glosson was the son of Daemon, but he had other sons as well, who possibly gave rise to, rise to other surnames. Looking at the DNA signature of those other surnames, we should see some kind of relationship with the Gleasons in Ulster. So, that's further research that needs to be done. I need to find out what are those associated surnames and then try and target those people for DNA testing. Um, but there's no Ulster Gleasons tested, no distinct group found, and there's no evidence as yet that these annals, as written, are correct. As yet. If we turn to East Cork, now we're more than an Alex says, Glaeson, from who are the we Glaeson, son of Brian, son of Meskel, son of Urhala, Dubdotua, and Conora. And these are uh, I, so I put that into an Excel spreadsheet and gave rough timelines for when that might actually occur because it would be very interesting to find out just when these people were supposedly born. Um, and then Brad, um, or Bart Yassi actually has uh, this in his publication as well. Um, they're supposed to be descended from the E. Mechkela, which is a sept of the E. Leohon. And there's the E. Leohon up there, a sept of the Dora, Kerba, Dora, Kerba up there. Um, related surnames were the O'Donagans. Hold on. The O'Donagans were mentioned in relation to North Tipperary, not East Cork. Are people getting their, people getting their wires crossed? You know, uh, because we have no idea what these earlier scholars had access to. They certainly don't have access to the digital uh, online resources that we have today. So this is research that still needs to be done to try and dissect out the various mistakes that previous researchers have made as well. And references like Wikipedia said that they're related to the O'Regans as well. Um, and again, where do they get that information from? It's not written on the Wikipedia edit page, so I cannot tell. But at least it's given me some clues. I need to look for O'Donagans, O'Dwyers, and O'Regans to see if they have similar genetic signatures to the Gleasons of East Cork. And this is the, the East Cork Gleason. Here's a map from... Um, uh, the Cork Historical and Archaeological Society Journal. And you can see Cork here, and I'm superimposing a, a modern map. This is the barony of Imokili. And just over here, on this side, but just west of Yule, is the Eglashine, or Eglashine territory, and here you can see it on an old map. There is E. Maktir, E. Makala, and you can see some of the other sets mentioned on the map as well. And again, there may be a genetic connection with some of these people. So the point is that there is information out there. Even the pipe roll of Cloyn, it describes these East Cork leases as being betas. And I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, beta. But uh, these were local land stewards. They controlled the land for the local gentry. And um, Larkin associates them with Bally Blissane House and Rath Cormac and Rath Blissane. And this is a quote from the um, pipe roll Pipe Roll of Cloyne, the Udlassen were the original name of the manor of Inchequin, which lay in the hinterland of the town of Yule, 
was substantially based on the native territory of Wi Glashin, eponyms of which were one of the regnal families of Imachala and ancestors to the many Gleason families found in the district today. That was written in 1939. Well, we need to test Gleasons from East Cork to see if their genetic signature is anything like the signature from North Tipperary. So, and here's a summary of the North Tip information. We have McLeisett's surname dictionary saying they originated in Muscury. They were the same stock as the O'Donogans, but we saw the O'Donogans mentioned in relation to East Cork. Crossed wires there, possibly. Were they Dalcassian? The Reverend John Gleeson said, yes, they were. But then his nephew, Dermot F. Gleeson, said, no, they're not. Uh, we also have Larkin saying they're associated with Plan, Concarb, Ara, Sept. And again, I need to get more information on the Ara. And they're associated with Ballyglishan near Ballyroan and Leash. Um, Dermot F. Gleeson, um, who did a lot of uh, uh, very, very good research and has, uh, is, is very, very, very well referenced, said they descend from the pre-Celtic race of the Muscari or Eron or Ara. And again, I need to get more information on what that actually means. But this, the associated surnames, and it's not clear if this association is a genetic one or a kinship one or a non-kinship one, includes the Malochnes, also known as Malochna, Maloney, Maloney, the Fihilis, also Fili, the O'Hogans, but the non-Dalcassian branch of the Hogans, and the Burkeries, also known as Baragra. Are there any Malochnes in the audience? Does anybody recognize any of these, three, these names among the list of their ancestors? And what, what name is that? Maloney? Maloney? And that just goes to show how rare these other names are and how difficult it is going to be to collect DNA to see if there's any association genetically between these associated families and the Gleasons of North Tipperary. Plenty of Hogan's in Ireland. Oh, Hogan's, yeah. Hogan's would be the exception. But um, Berkery is still uh, is quite a rare name. Tipperary, very, very Tipperary. Fihili and Fihili? North Tip. So there are many of them around? Well, oh, I'll be coming to you later, Michael, please. <laughs> Lots of Hogans, definitely. But a lot of the Hogans will be Dalcassian rather than non-Dalcassian. So that North Tipperary signature is established. I think I'm 99% happy that it has been established by the DNA project. But there's no evidence that the annals are true um, unless... Um, some of the matches that we're getting with the Gleasons are called McLaughlin and McLaughlin. So I'm wondering if that's um, uh, a corruption of Malochny. McLaughlin, McLaughlin, Malochny. Again, uh, an interesting theory that will lead us down to further DNA testing. So now we can add in a few more bits of information on our chart. We know that the Ulsters are associated with the tribe of Dolfiatok. The East Cork Leasons are associated with the tribe of the Elia Horn, and the O'Donagan is possibly a link between the East Cork and the North Tip. So that's where I am currently with that particular theory. Um, I might have to do a PhD <laughs> to actually complete all this work. It is a huge amount of work. Um, um, and not enough men have been tested from East Cork or Ulster at this point in time. And there's no evidence that the annals are true as yet. But at least we have access to the annals in a way we did not have previously, and we have pointers for further avenues of research. So we've looked at, if the annals are true, what percentage of the Gleasons would you expect to share the clan DNA signature? That's an interesting question. Do you think that if the annals were true, uh, how many people think that... Uh, the Gleasons would share the clan DNA signature, the North Tip Gleasons. How many of them do you think would be, um, uh, would, would have that North Tip signature? Uh, just over 50%? Over less than 50%? Okay, the majority of people are saying less than 50%. Here's an interesting slide from Brad Larkin, who took a look at just how many people, given a certain surname, have the DNA signature of that actual surname. And if we look at the O'Briens, and we have uh, Dennis O'Brien, Dennis Wright, and Robert Casey here in the audience who are intimately associated with this information, only about 19% um, of people with the name O'Brien have the clan signature L226 as their DNA signature. 
So only 19% of the O'Briens have the definitive DNA marker for the O'Briens. Only about 6% of the Kennedys have the definitive marker for the Kennedys as part of their genetic signature. The Caseys are a little bit different. 50% of the Caseys have that uh, genetic signature, possibly because Robert has actually gone out and swabbed all of them. <laughs> um, Hogan's as well, only 31% of the Hogan's have the definitive signature associated with the Hogan's. The McGraths are 23%, the Careys are 17%. And what this clearly tells us is the vast majority of people will not possess the DNA signature of their originating clan. Some clan DNA will have filtered through, but only some and in relatively small quantities. And therefore, many men will need to test their Y-DNA in order to detect this relatively weak signal coming from our clan originators. And that's a very important point, because we need more men to test. Absolutely, we need more men to test. You might think, oh, you know, you've got 19 Gleasons in lineage 2. Isn't that enough? No, it's not enough. We need 1,900. So we need many, many more men to actually do their DNA testing, their Y DNA testing. So we've, we've looked at what would you expect to find in the DNA results based on the ancient texts. Now let's go back um, to the DNA again. Let's look at haplogroup, uh, haplogroup DNA. If the history is wrong, does the DNA tell us anything? Does it give us any clues? Supposing the history is all wrong, what does the DNA, who does the DNA tell us we are related to? And that's when you look at the haplotree DNA data, going back and, and asking it, does it tell us anything about the genealogy? And you'll see this, this uh, picture before. This is the big tree. What I've managed to do now is, uh, well, first of all, this is Alex Williamson's big tree, which only contains NGS data, next generation sequencing. This is only people who have tested with the big Y or the 1000 Genome Project and have done those very extensive and expensive tests. It's not comprehensive. And what I did was I went to Nigel McCarthy's website, the Z255 project, the ORL21 haplogroup project, and the Ireland Y-DNA project, and I included people who had single SNPs tests or who had downstream SNPs tested on SNP packs. And what I was able to find was two carols in the Z255 project, two more carols, they fitted in there, um, and two McMahons who were Z163435 positive, uh, one of them from Z255, one of them from Ireland Y-DNA. I also found a couple of McCarthy's from Nigel's project. I found uh, two more McMahon's and the McLaughlin, uh, one branch further up um, from the Z255 project. I found an O'Keefe in the uh, L21 project. I found an organ, or that might be a Hogan or an organ, Hogan, in uh, the Morrison in the Z255 who are tested up at Z16437, so they could be anywhere downstream of that. And I also found um, a Bowman, a Nicholson, a McConnell, and a Mac. And then what I did was I looked at surnames, and I did a surname analysis, and I found that just based on SCR data, there was an additional list of surnames that could be associated with the name Gleason. I think that's a very dangerous um, analysis to do because you don't know what you're dealing with and there's going to be a huge amount of convergence potentially in the, that SCR data and I would say the majority of these names, if not all of them, are red herrings. But I spent two days doing that analysis. <laughs> and there's the dates again. Now just to give you an idea of uh, Gleason territory, here are the Gleasons here, this is Loch Derg, the Shannon is out here, the, the mouth of the Shannon, uh, Nina is roundabout somewhere up there, and uh, the nearest neighbours would include people like the uh, O'Carrolls of Ely, the Ely O'Carroll, the McMahons over in uh, East Clare, the McCarthys in North Cork. Uh, so that gives you an idea of the uh, topography of the area. And what we find, and remember, one of the close matches was Phelps. And I'll just go back to that tree. Here's a Phelps down here. So... The question is, why do we have these surnames as close neighbours? Okay? How do you explain a Phelps being related to the Gleasons? Maybe 500 or 1,000 years back, but how do you explain it? Well, Thomas Phelps was a Cromwellian soldier from Gloucestershire, granted lands in County Tipperary, 
and these are the lands he was granted. There's Killis Scully, there's Ballina Hinge. This is exactly where my Gleason family lived. So, you know, Thomas Phelps was granted land right beside where the Gleasons had a stronghold. And probably what happened is that uh, Mrs. Phelps couldn't have a baby, so they adopted a local child who had been fathered by either a Gleason or a McMahon or a McCarthy or one of those names from the surrounding area, and that's why there is a genetic association between the Gleasons and Phelps. Phelps, which is uh, most highly concentrated in Gloucestershire in England. And there should be no reason at all why that particular group of family in Gloucestershire are related to the Gleasons of North Tipperary. Another example is Bell. Bell was a very close match. And this chap here uh, is Z255. His most distant known ancestor was Percy Bell, born in 1912 in New Orleans, Louisiana. And he's African-American. How does an African-American get related to Gleasons of North Tipperary? Probability is that is a legacy of slavery, that a, a Gleason or a McMahon or a McCarthy or a McCarroll went over to America and fathered a child and these are his descendants. So it's very, very important to look at the genealogy of the people that you're matching. It always comes back to traditional genealogy, and that will tell you a huge amount of information that may change your theory on how the various people are connected. So looking at the North Tipperary Carroll match, um, and uh, here you see Z255, so there's quite a match. There's a, the Carrolls are, are on the immediate adjacent branch. There are 16 members in this group, so it's not likely to be a recent NPE. If it was a recent NPE, you'd probably get much uh, uh, smaller people. And if you look, and if I could, but I can't because I'm not the administrator of this project, if I could look at the time to uh, most recent ancestor of the most distantly related, it would give me some indication of when this group arose. Um, I can't do that. The administrator of the Carroll Project can. And um, uh, one of my tasks is to write to that person and say, can you tell me how old this group is? And he'll probably come back and say, oh, well, it's somewhere pretty old, around about 1300s. That's my calculation just based on the number of mutations you see among the members of that particular group. So it's not a recent NPE. We're not looking at the 1850s. We're looking at way, way, way back. So the, the, the proximity of the Elio Carroll to the Gleasons makes me think that a lot of these people here are probably Carrolls by name, but Gleasons by DNA, perhaps because an ancient Gleason swore allegiance to one of the O'Carrolls. Or an ancient Gleason was adopted by the O'Carrolls and inherited the surname that way. Or this could be an example of fostering back in the 1300s. So these are various theories that you can come up with as a result of this uh, analysis. Uh, but there's no clear indication of which came first, the O'Carroll Gleason or the, chick the, uh, the O'Carroll chicken or the, the Gleason egg. Similarly with the McMahons, here's the group that we match. And you can see also that there are 16 members in this group. It's well established. There's many mutations among this group, so it's not likely to be a recent MPE. It's probably pre-1300s. Uh, people are coming from Galway, Limerick, Clare, and Kerry. So it is quite spread out, not really around the Tipperary area. But the proximity to the McMahons of Thomond, which is just across the river in Clare, suggests that there was a close connection between the two. Um, maybe these are McMahons by name, but again, Gleasons by DNA. Did the Gleasons swear allegiance to the McMahons? Did um, a McMahon... A uh, couple adopt a Gleason child because they were barren. You know, these are the kind of theories that you can come up with. Lastly, the McCarthys, with whom we have a quite a close connection, they were kings of Desmond, then Cork and Kerry. McCarthys by name, Gleasons by DNA, possibly. Uh, the O'Keefe was also an offshoot, and Creamer, because we had a Creamer among our matches, is an agnomen of McCarthys. A West Cork McCarthy family known as to the writer, which took Cremaine as an agnomen, in due course became the Creamer family following migration to London. Again, coming back to the traditional genealogical techniques gives you an explanation for what you're actually seeing. So that's the uh, technique that I've used to try and uh, link uh, and explain why my Gleasons are related to Carols and Phelps and Bells and Creamers and McCarthys. 
And maybe this is uh, more what it looks like. The Phelps and the Bell were probably recent non-paternity events in the last couple of hundred years. The link between the Gleasons and the Carrolls uh, and the McCarthys might be ancient MPEs or even pre-surname clan connections. At this point in time, it's still too early to tell, and we need a lot more people to test in order to answer that question. So, and we also need associated surnames to do that test as well. So that's the current status of uh, the, the spreadsheet summarizing the DNA and our deeper origins. So some clan connections have already been well established, and we've had wonderful presentations today from Dennis, uh, Dennis O'Brien, Dennis Wright, and Robert Casey talking about the Dal Gosh and Irish Type 3 uh, and also the L226 uh, projects. Uh, we previously had presentations about the Munster Irish uh, from Elizabeth O'Donoghue Ross, who is in the room somewhere, and oh, there she is, there, I see the hand, and Nigel McCarthy and uh, Finbar O'Mahony. And Brad Larkin gave a wonderful talk last year about the DNA and its association with uh, the Irish annals, and that's well worthwhile looking at as well. It's important to remember that most people will not bear the distinctive DNA signature of their surname, and we need to do a lot more Y-DNA testing to try and tease out all these various components. Um, connecting to the ancient clans can be very difficult, especially for the lesser clans, the Indians rather than the chiefs, um, and uh, we may not appear in these ancient annals, these ancient texts. Uh, so that's another challenge as well. Uh, next generation sequencing is, is really changing this whole landscape and we will be getting a lot more information from these NGS tests and these new SNPs that we're discovering all the time. The haplogroup administrators are a boundless source of information, advice and support and I encourage everybody who joins the surname project to join the corresponding haplogroup project as well. You saw that for my uh, uh, chart, my descendancy chart, I had to go into various haplogroup projects to get the members who had not been included in Alex Williamson's big tree. And that's one of the big challenges, is that um, a person who's tested might join one haplogroup project, but there's others that he could join that he doesn't. Or there's other geographic projects, like the Munster Irish project, that they don't join. So you really have to look at a variety of different sources, try and harvest all of the relevant information for the analysis that you're doing. Luckily, many of the animals are now online, and uh, we can make use of that. Uh, do we have a wiki page for the ancient animals, Debbie? No. Wow, you've got great homework when you go back, don't you? Um, somebody else can do that. Okay, I'll volunteer. Um, so we will be able to collate them, and as more of these animals become digitized and become available online, we will be able to use that as a, a great resource. And I think also with the advent of things like uh, Richard III, um, we'll be using more um, profound and... Uh, in-depth statistical analyses like Bayesian statistics or correlation coefficients to actually link the different surnames with specific genetic signatures. And John Reed, who's in the audience, did a, a wonderful lecture last year on how they use Bayesian statistics to um, identify the remains of Richard III with 99.96% probability. It was more than that. I think, I think there were a couple of extra point nines there, wasn't there? Yes. So um, that's all I have for you. Thank you very, very much for listening. Uh, I'll answer any questions you have. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll turn on the microphone for you. If Debbie can be kind enough to do the, uh, do the rounds, then we've got a few uh, moments for a few questions. Oh, thank you. That was a fantastic talk. Um, I'm a bit overexcited, so I've got two questions. One is, um, while we're quite romantically and excitedly looking backwards, it just seems amazing how far you've gone back, do you think in a brave new world kind of way there might be room for when you've given birth to a baby that you took its DNA? Or is that a bit sinister? Oh, no, I think that's coming. Uh, it's probably going to be here in the next 10 years. You'll do a heel prick test. And instead of just testing for the inborn errors of metabolism, it'll do the whole genomic sequence, and it'll also give you 50% of your, of your ancestors. So do you think that's dangerous? Or does it I think that is a topic that, that will have to be discussed by society. Um, uh, just to give you an example, um, when the phone book came out in the 1950s, people were in uproar. They said, this is the end of privacy. Mm. 
So, you know, the, the concerns they had in the 1950s about the phone book are exactly the same concerns we're having today about Facebook. People posting everything, teenagers posting things on Facebook that are going to come back to haunt them. You know, if you think Hillary and Donald are having trouble, just, you know, wait another couple of years. <laughs> you had a second question. Yeah, my second question is, um, I've overexcitedly got my children tested with the Ancestry 70 pounds ish yeah. DNA test, but I want to do all that you've done. So, um, um, not advocating anybody in particular, but where would you recommend that we get the, the y DNA, is DNA a, test? Y DNA is only done by family tree DNA. So if you wanted to uh, get your male children tested for their direct male line, father, 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 then um, get them to do the Y DNA test. It was me I was more interested in. Right, well you don't have a Y chromosome, unfortunately. How do I do that? Well, do you have a brother? No, I'm first cousin. Do you have a first cousin? No, no, I'm adopted, I haven't got anything. So oh, how right. do I go back? Well, you simply have to find your birth family and then get one of the males there to do the test. Okay. I'll do that now. Yeah. But which test would you, which was the most thorough and um, cost effective that you would suggest? For, for adoptees or? No, for people generally. For people generally. Um, I think if you're going to dip your toe in the water, do an autosomal DNA test. Mm. So, and you can do that with any of the three companies. If you're interested in the medical aspect of things, do it with 23andMe. If you're just interested in a general test, then Ancestry or Family Tree DNA would be absolutely fine. Okay. Thank you so much. Cool. Uh, there are several other questions, Gerard and then Ed and... Uh, great. Uh, thanks very much, Morris. Very interesting. Uh, the good news, of course, is that the three uh, names you mentioned, um, uh, McMahon's, Jim McMahon is the administrator. Excellent. They have extensive research on the McMahon. Uh, on the Eli O'Carroll's is probably one of the best research projects. And that's uh, Peter Riggins. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, we all know Nigel McCarthy. And sure, and I've been in touch with all of them. Yeah, superb. So, and um, the, the McMahon and the Eli O'Carroll are linked. This is a Via de San Colet, which is a broader fan grouping. So, it's possible that these things may be under that broader umbrella. Sure, sure. <laughs> Before too many people escape, um, I'd just like to thank uh, Morris for organising uh, such a wonderful conference yeah, and yeah. for inviting um, Dennis O'Brien, myself, um, uh, and uh, Robert Casey uh, to speak on behalf of uh, our particular thing. But um, take a bow, well done. Thank you. Going back to East Cork. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From Cork. Um, have you considered surname substitutions for the East Cork guy? Um, the reason why I'm saying is because we've got the O'Donovan clan on that side of the country, but they are actually recorded as Donigans in records, and that's quite acceptable. Mm -hmm. Very uh, interesting. And we've also got a good clutch of Hogan's as well on the border with Waterford. Okay. So that's something to, to think about. I'll be coming down to you for a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, the thing uh, we've got is, um, in the records, is we've got similar surnames to North Tip in the Macaulay as well. So other surnames from, mm. from North Tip area. So there was so a migration? There's something going on there. Yeah, but obviously, we, so there we go back to 1790, so you know, you're getting as much of the Thanks for that. I mean, this illustrates how important it is to get local history to actually inform your research as well. Just next. Just more as kind of a follow on from the previous question. Uh, anything in the, the annals or any explanation for such large migration, for example, that one from East Cork to North to Prairie, um, or how far back would it have taken place? And That's a very good question, and I don't know why to that. Why would there be such migration? Surely it wasn't lack of land at that time. The population of the country was very, very small. Well, there would have been several migrations, like the O'Sullivan Bear, wasn't that a major migration? Uh, yeah. The plantation displaced people. Um, yeah, yeah, but, should, yeah. but yeah. should we know that Leeson's were in Arctic back to 1300, and it's right. according to Dermot Leeson, so it must be well, well back before that. I think it'd be very interesting to test the East Cork Leeson's and just see if there is a genetic connection there with the North Tip Leeson's. There seems to be a lot of overlap and crisscrossing in some of the animal. Uh, the evidence, mm -hmm. and, and so we need to do the DNA testing to actually try and sort it out. Who sponsored the Lower Horn Nail? Surely it was written to <laughs> favourable towards the, the writer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the 
Franciscans sponsored Laura more than that. Yeah. Hi, Morris. Morris, Hi. It was, that was a great presentation. After really, You're well done. Thank you. But I have a, an interesting. You mentioned Nigel McCarthy there. I'm interested. You know, would you try and do the same methods that Nigel is doing in his DNA testing? Because I'm I'm part of his group actually, and two of his groups. Like, would you, would you be interested in the same sort of thing for Gleason's? Um, I have done it, and there is a YouTube video where I've built a mutation history tree based on yeah, 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 based on um, Nigel's methods, which is basically anchoring the upper branches of the tree, the more upstream branches, with SNP testing, and then we'll using the SDORs to actually try and uh, do the finer branching more downstream, bringing you up to the present day. And have you found that? Is it is it made? It's challenging um, because it's not automated. So it's ever, I'm, I'm using an Excel spreadsheet and doing like nice little lines and colored boxes and all that kind of stuff. So it takes hours. Um, but it is interesting at this point to see that the Gleason then goes back to at least 1200 genetically. Um, from this analysis, it goes back to at least 1125. And again, those are broad uh, estimates. Mm -hmm. But you know, we are going back to very close to when the Gleason surname began. Um, I think in the future, when we do have a little bit of automation, we will have a better definition. Currently, Nigel is only using 67 marker Y-DNA results, and I think he's right, because certainly when you don't have a lot of branches within the CERNIN project, you do need that higher level of um, definition and delineation, and I think 67 gives you that, 37 probably is not and I'm finding it difficult to plot my 37 marker members on the tree. 67 is much easier, 111 uh, much easier again. One of the things I want to do is go through Nigel's Z255 uh, family tree and calculate the number of back mutations and parallel mutations that you see below Z25 and actually put a percentage on each of those types of, of uh, uh, mutation. I think you have to agree and I don't have the microphone now. Like Nigel is working on animals and he's mapping them back. They are kind of working out, in a way. Uh, yes, no, Nigel has done some fantastic work, and in many ways, ways he's a pioneer of this uh, technique, certainly in Ireland anyway. Um, and, and he's done some fantastic work with Elizabeth and Andrew Ross and Bimor O'Malley from the Munster Irish Project. So um, I always point people towards Nigel and his wonderful phylogenetic trees. Uh, certainly in my presentation on YouTube, I use his uh, phylogenetic tree uh, quite a lot as well. We have time for two more questions, and then we'll have to leave it and move on to Ed Gilbert to tell us about the Irish DNA Atlas. Very good. Thank you, Morris. That was wonderful. Um, I prefix my one question with a request that you display the page that had a listing of the various textual sources. So oh, sure. I found the information, so I can make note. Um, my question relates to that first question asked by the lady up front. Um, am I correct in thinking that the Irish Health Service Executive or our maternity hospitals had a reservoir of 100,000 or 200,000 DNA samples. And was that reservoir destroyed or sustained or put, I, put in I storage? I don't honestly know, but I imagine if they do have a reservoir, that they will not have a consent from the people to do anything with it other than what they've already done, which was check those babies for inborn errors of metabolism, that every, you know, the Hedoprick test. Yeah, but Ed, Ed, Ed might actually have an answer to that. Um, but I think it's a very, very good question. Is there a reservoir of DNA that we already have available in Ireland? Um, so, for the metabolic, uh, metabolic diseases, it will most likely just be a biochemical test. So it won't be testing with, it'll be testing with DNA, but it won't have like a, a test with the auto. And also, you won't have the ethics to be able to do that. Yeah, exactly. You just won't. Sorry. Cool. One last question, thank you. I would like to ask, how is the authentic DNA of any surname established? How is it established? Um, that is a major question. Um, we have people here like Dennis O'Brien who would love to answer that question. Uh, it, takes, it takes a lot of testing. So you have to test a lot of men. Um, and you have to compare their DNA profile against each other. Those that have a similar profile are grouped together. And you get enough people in a group then you've got a DNA signature for that group. Now, what uh, Dennis Rice did um, in his 2009 publication was he took uh, all the Dalcassian names that are identified from the ancient annals 
and he said, okay, well, if, if this genetic signature is the genetic signature of the Dalcassian uh, families, uh, characterized by these various surnames, Dalcassian surnames, do we see this genetic signature more commonly in people with Dalcassian surnames than people without Dalcassian surnames? And if I'm correct, it was like 40% of people who had Dalcassian surnames had that DNA signature, and only 10% of people with non-Dalcassian surnames had that DNA signature, and that was a significant difference. I hope I've summarized your life's work. Have a good week. I know it's late, but I just want to make one small comment that I think is worthwhile. Sure. Um, you've got a number of, of uh, surnames that are related to the Alcades, and yes, they are not all L226, but a number of them are also Irish type 2, the CTS 466, which is a, a, a very major monster surname as well. So that genetic history is going back well beyond where anybody took names. And it's split in there all together, they're intermarrying, and it can sometimes be next to impossible to figure out what the true story might be. Absolutely, because a lot of the signals are very, very weak. Um, and you have to remember that families died out, families dautered out, and so sometimes uh, you'll only discover very, very late in the day that you actually have quite a rare DNA signature that has managed to sneak through that happened recently with the chairman of the Decent Plan Gathering, Michael G. Gleason, who is sitting there trying to, to, to look invisible. Uh, and he also has a bag from the Decent Plan Gathering. Um, uh, he was in the ungrouped, possibly adopted uh, section for quite a long time, until I looked closely at his, his, the, the, the slip markers of his matches, and I noticed they were all Z255, like the North Tipperary Gleasons. And I thought, Let's do a single SNP test to be on the safe side. And he came back as Z255. I said, okay, now do the Z255 SNP pack. He matched all the Gleasons in North Tipperary, but he is a genetic distance of 18 out of 37 to the other SNP confirmed Gleason on the far side of the Gleason clan. 18 out of 37. And on that note, I will leave it. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll be starting now with Ed Gilbert and the Irish DNA Atlas update.